All right, everyone, we're going to wait a few seconds because the first few seconds always gets cut off and nobody's ever watching. So let's uh, just relax for 10 seconds. Anybody there yet? Yes, we have 38 people. Th oh, yeah, th oh, sorry, 38. There's 86 people. 86 people. Welcome, gonna... everyone. Oh, Let people it's... just left. <laughs> 80, 82. <laughs> All right, welcome everyone to the live stream. Tonight we are launching a new course and the course is with Sarah Parkinson Howell, this lovely lady here, okay. Uh, the course is Color Theory. It is going live right now on Bring Your Own Laptop. Welcome to the sh live stream, Sarah. The live stream, <laughs> hey Dan. First time live streamer here, so. Uh... Well, people Slightly probably nervous. might know you from the podcast. If you don't, Sarah, and yeah. uh, you enjoy tonight, there's a lot of conversations that me and have uh, me and Sarah have uh, on the Bring Your Own Laptop uh, podcast. It is on the Bring Your Own Laptop uh, website, uh, so check that out. So, welcome to the live uh, show. Tell us what your course is. It's about color theory. Tell us a little bit about it. What do you do? Yeah, it's about color theory. Um, so it's about color theory, um, and I look at it from a designer's point of view. Although, if you're a photographer the sort of first part of it is all about color theory um, rather than the practical kind of thing so it's still worthwhile watching it talks um, to color psychology talks you through the color wheel which you, you know probably you know heard of but don't wheel, understand but not yeah exactly like everyone probably did a color wheel when they were at kindergarten or school or art class <laughs> the first week and it's color in all these boxes or whatever but actually understanding how to use them and um, the kind of emotions that are attached to color and stuff. So yeah, it's kind of all around that. And then I give some practical guidance, you know, into sort of Pantone, Hex and- Get a, So like starts quite general and then gets a little bit more specific for yeah. designers, yeah? Designers, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so people watching now, because uh, this is live, and um, you get to ask questions. So any questions about stuff we're talking about? We're going to have some story starter questions that we've got ready, but we want questions from you. So put them into the live stream comments, and uh, Taylor will put them on the board here for us to get to. And so ask questions. And, and also another question, me and Sarah, uh, Sarah thought it would be a good idea, is if you've got a brand, particularly a brand that has a color scheme that you either don't like or don't understand, Pop that into the comments as well. And Taylor, if you could put those somewhere special on our list of just brands that you either don't like, don't understand, think the colors are terrible. So go to a search now of the colors of the brands you don't, stick them in there and Sarah will have a little look at them and see if she can deconstruct either what you're seeing or add a little bit of value here. So the link to the course, okay, it's Color Theory with Sarah Parkinson How It is a link in the description right now. But if you go to byol.com, you will see it on the home page. So let's start with um, the first question. Sarah Parkinson, you ready? Yeah, <laughs> I think yeah. so. <laughs> In its simpler form, uh, simplest form, what is what is color theory? So Dan and listeners uh color theory is kind of both a science or well, the science and the art of using color so it explains how humans perceive color its visual effects um how colors are mixed and matched um you know how what their relationship is to each other uh and then also uh, the, the you know the kind of messages that they communicate so they might make you feel calm or um, happy or, or that kind of thing. So, and then also within it is how colors are talked about before, you know, CMYK, RGB, Pantone, that kind of thing as well. Great. Um, yeah, and then, and so, yeah, and it's based around that color wheel, which, you know, it sort of comes out of that. Um, um, that follow on from that, like the the color theory, there's some yeah. color science as well. Like, is do some colors like is there a scientific reason why some colors work and don't work, or is it like you know like periods of fashionable time colors seem to change like yeah or it's a bit of a mix of both yeah 
Make some books. I get what I get what you mean. Like it, there is there is yeah there is ways that we receive color in our eye and you know like um, I think yellow is the, the color that your eye sees first. So um, you know that's that's science, right? But then there's also things that we attach to yellow as a result of kind of cultural stuff. So there's kind of a mix of both the scientific and the the, the art or the cultural kind of side of things. Gotcha, and. Uh... So it's common to hear that some, yeah, you talk about the, you know, yellow means something and, you know, at what, like, in terms of cultures and, like, do does everybody see yellow the same? Like, can I throw my yellow logo in? No, I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, yeah oh, so. Mean culturally? Because oh, nobody knows, like, I don't know if you see yellow in the same way I see yellow. I mean culturally. Um, yeah, I mean, culturally, I mean, like, like red obviously means yeah. something very different. In I know in China it does. It's a kind of a different color, but yeah, is there like do you keep that in mind when you're looking at that, or is yeah? I guess that's my question: is colors set yeah, in stone, so or guess, are they adaptive? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess, yeah, what you're asking is like, has color changed through time? Does color hold different meaning to different people? Yes, it's subjective, you know, a lot of it. But there's also some, you know, um, things that still hold true, like happy colors are probably or active colors which are kind of the warm um, colors on the side of the color wheel from say like yellow through to purple so those are active warm colors and they've got high energy um, you know it's it's passive um, have that you know everywhere so people have sort of adapted you know to understand color or to take on color with brands in certain ways um, but definitely you know like you said before China I mean red is a huge color in China it means good luck and things like that whereas in some countries you know it's bloodshed or <laughs> you know um, but most of us could say that love you know red is the color of love so so you know that there, there is differences and i think if you're designing specifically for a country or a territory then you're definitely going to look into what the color color meanings are in that country or that place. that's a good point like you brought up you like know, somebody um, did something is it me lagging or is it sarah taylor they're from europe so they didn't have that I'm always lagging. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it's me, Taylor, because I can reset, or let me know if it's me or Taylor. You should be uh, Taylor. You should know if it's me or Sarah. And um, sorry, I kind of jumped in there with a question. And um, you talked about red. Like red's an interesting color because it's like, how do you, you know, how, how do you you talk about red being kind of what was it, uh, you know, active and love and. But it also can be like horror and like, how does a new designer decide whether red's horror and bloodthirsty or Valentine's Day? Like it's a, how does that work? Like how, yeah. how do you separate those out when you're deciding as I a I guess, you know, red designer? is a powerful, yeah, I get what you mean. It's a powerful color, right? It's energetic, exciting, strong, emotional. It's, it's basically, you know, we've all got red blood you know, so it's about life. Um, and then that's also the horror. It's the same, you know, it's about life, life and death kind of thing. So I guess, um, and it's not, or, you know, a scary skull or whatever. But, you know, as opposed to Virgin Active or Virgin Airlines, where they're using red or Coca-Cola, for example, and, and, and theirs is, you know, if you drink Coke, you'll look sexy. Oh, 
All right, Sarah, you're lagging quite a bit. Um, could you have a little systems check? Uh, if there's anything you can do about the internet. Other internet on. While Sarah's checking internet, I will see the questions that I can answer in here. So there is questions in here that I can answer and when Sarah becomes not giant pixels, I'll uh, jump it back in. So one is here from uh, Javad. What is white balancing in Premiere Pro? So it's kind of color, like with anything, especially I, I'm more of the software guy, so it's a good question for me. Uh, kind of like retouching in Photoshop or uh, um, photography or in um, uh, Premiere Pro has white balancing. It's about getting your whites right. So in here, can you see Sarah there? That wall behind her is probably white. Um, and but my wall is very white okay it's about getting consistently white in the uh, in the color wheel so hers was full of a lot of gray so when you do white balancing across different things it's a great way of setting this shot gloomily in low light this shot over here in a really uh, bright light it's about getting them closer together and making sure you start with getting the whites together um, so that was a good question that is white balancing. You're getting the whites kind of down to a, a matching level. You get the blacks to a matching level, then you're going to have consistency across different shots. Um, <laughs> Emma, we uh, Emma. Let's get Sarah back in. How's that? You're back. Hello. Not quite. <laughs> um, Had a quick break. Yes. You're back. You're still lagging okay. pretty bad. Don't know where we were. Should we ask a new question? <laughs> oh. Yes. Uh, we'll pretend like you're doing, like, uh, what do you got? Is there anything I can do? I don't think there's anything I can do. So we will go with a question. We'll give you another one. Uh, you want to look. Okay, Jesse question. When would you use white font over black font, vice versa? That kind of like, uh, you know, looking for that kind of like, neg you know, the white on black, rather than trying to do a logo that way or design that way. Um, are we thinking specifically for, yeah, a logo? I reckon um, logo. I mean, it... it yeah, because I was thinking like maybe a newspaper print, you wouldn't use white type on black because it would bleed and you wouldn't pick up on the type. Um, that was like the old rules. We, we, you, know, so you, couldn't do, design... you couldn't do that negative yeah, thing because of what... bleed on newspapers. Yeah, but... yeah. I mean, you can, can in some circumstance, yeah. And, you know, you'd have to make sure your type was a certain size or weight. But, you know, now so much of what we're producing is in the digital space anyway. So, you know, you don't have to go very far to find beautiful completely black websites with you know nice white type um so i think it's fine um in a in a in a logo i mean in a logo you're gonna need it to be able to go on into a black or white or colored background anyway so it's a bit of you know often when you're providing a you know a brand brand asset for for your client to use you're giving them options which allow them to use it reversed out or on a black background or a colored background or whatever. So you so, do both of them. You do both. Yeah, you end. always kind of produce both. I mean, the thing with brands at the moment is they're, they're, there's so many touch points now that they're going on. So when you're using color, you know, you might have this full gradiented logo, which you're using in digital, but then you would have a version that can be printed in a newspaper, for example. So brands have to be a bit more flexible and fluid in terms of, um, where they go and output. So they might be embroidered, you know, so you're going to want to have a one color logo or two color logo for that. So I guess um, just allowing for the, the fact that we've got so many touch points now. Um, um, Nikki's got a question. Do you yeah. or should you allow for a percentage of viewers that are colorblind? And if yes, how? I've got some. Yeah, that is a good that question. Accessibility. Yeah. Um, is, is that because you're colorblind, Dan? I have a touch of it. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I do. <laughs> I think um, a, lot of, a lot of men yeah. have a mild kind of 
yeah, men, one out of, I think, 12 men and one out of every 200 women are completely colorblind and there's a kind of a spectrum in there. So I think it's important, like, there are some things I just don't see a really big contrast for. So my design work either, you know, I, I exaggerate those colors and it's kind of something that I end up being my, it becomes my, You like, need a, my you unique, need a woman to check it out. Well, I think it becomes my uniqueness <laughs> in point. my design, you know? Yeah, it is. It's like, I, well, it's a trademark yeah, of like, might... those two are always exaggerated because I need, you know, them to be pulled out a little bit more than normal people. So it becomes, uh, look, like, I think, um, is it Picasso? Like, you mean higher the kind contrast, of, yeah. Yeah, just, it becomes, uh, yeah, well, there's nothing you can do about it. So it's kind of becomes part of your repertoire. Hey, Sarah, do you want to turn the video off and we'll just do audio so it might work a bit better? Can't select no camera. Cool. Let me see if I can turn it off and just have you in here by audio. Oh, she's gone. All right, question. Um, let's go for this one. Matthew, when designing a consultancy run, the panel with black and white text, it's unclear, color text. Okay, meta. Picking a color that's more for me and not for Sarah. What well, question in here is about um, monitors and like keeping color consistency across monitors. Now, if you have, you know, if you're worried, it's very really tricky to get colors to be consistent across different devices. And there are a special, like I used to work in retouching in magazines and like they gave us like 10,000 $10,000 monitors and they had like a hood on it. They were very hot and you had to wear them with like a cloak over the back of your head. It was all dark. And we had these very expensive monitors and like you can get your monitor close and these other monitors were perfect, but perfect against what? They were calibrated against printing machines that were right next to me. So that was the consistency. If you were, if we were sending something to print from somebody else, like a sign writer down the road, there was no color consistency. The, the trick is to get it anywhere near close is to make sure you're using the same kind of RGB style. There's different kinds of RGB and it's not so much that you need to have the right one, it's more that they need to be consistent. So if you're using kind of Adobe SRS RGB like I am on this, it's making sure your monitor is using the same one so that there is consistency. But I'm looking at these two monitors now and they're meant to be using the same color, wheel, uh, color field. And although the colors might be the same, the brightness is so different that it's too hard to actually um, kind of balance those two out. So uh, let me bring Sarah in. Hello, Sarah. You're back. Hey, I'm here. Hey, is are. my camera still on? Your camera's still I on. I tried to block it. <laughs> Just put your hand over the top. <laughs> what kind of comedy is this? Okay. All right, so I got a question from uh, Jaylee. Hi, I'm interested in how colorways can be developed in the design process. It's very broad. Okay. Yeah. So, like, how to get started, maybe. Yeah, like, like, like how to build a one. group of them. Okay. Like... Yeah. Yeah, how to get, because mm. sometimes, you know, depending on, say, if you're doing a, a design, you know, you may already have corporate colors or they may have one corporate color, but you need some other accent colors to help sort of develop a longer form document or something. Um, so there may be already um, a few colors to get you started, or you may be from, starting from scratch. So for me, if it's a, a brand that, you know, is B2B or if it's B2C, like business to consumer, you know, there's, there's going to be different decisions you make when choosing colors. So often you just have a feeling or you're using your intuition. Um, but it's also important to not forget that color can have a great impact. And so choosing something 
that's out of the norm could actually be really good for your brand. So, um, let's say you start with a color. If though, you're starting with one color, how do you like yeah. say you're new? You, so you said you intuition, might, but can you do? Could you use yeah. some of the science of color wheel? Like, how would you go to the color wheel if you're new and say, "I've got this one color. How do I make? How do I get another color that is good with it? Without you know, is there a scientific way or?" A, could you look at the color wheel if you're new yeah, and so kind of you're get... look at your harmony? Yeah, exactly. You're going to look at your color harmonies, which are based around your color wheel. So complementary, split complementary, analogous. So these are all color rules um, or harmonies, and they have different feelings. So a high contrast complementary color scheme is much more dynamic, and it's quite high contrast. So they, the colors could crash clash. So um, you know, red and green is is a complementary color scheme, um, and you think of Christmas automatically. So you may not, <laughs> you know, go for red and green, but you know, you could you could choose a slightly reddy pink and a much lighter green, and those colors can kind of work well together. So you're changing the value, um, like the tone, tint, or shade of that color to help them match a bit better and not be so high in contrast. But you may want high in contrast because it's a high energy thing that you're doing. For example. Um, sports teams, you know, LA Lakers, New York Knicks, they're all using complementary color schemes. But if you're creating a brand for a massage therapist, for example, you are not going to choose high contrast because I want it to be a relaxing experience, calm. So I'm probably going to go for monochromatic or an a, a, um, uh, and an, an analogous color scheme, which is colors that are similar to each other. Mm. And those so th those terms, for people that are new. Blue, purple, yeah. Sorry, those terms, they are new. Okay. They're like analogous and uh, complement. They're, and they're actually things you can actually map out on that. You can actually get out the color wheel, Google it, go to Sarah's course and know what they are and use that as a starting point, right? Yeah, totally. And, you know, there's so many tools out there as well. Um, and I go through my course, I show you um, Adobe Color, and that actually has those harmonies within it. So you could start with a color in there. Say you start with purple, and then if you're choosing a complementary color scheme, it's going to give you, you know, yellows and oranges and things. So, but you can move through the different harmonies, and it will choose a color scheme based on that base color. So that first purple that you choose which may be your business color and then you go through the other harmonies and I mean it's it's such a great tool and it's great to get out of the programs that you're using and it doesn't matter if you're using affinity or other um, programs other than Adobe stuff it's it's available online it's a great resource and it actually has a lot of accessibility tools in there now as well so for um, color blind or for blindness um, you know so how to choose high contrast yeah, that's a good point. Um, accessibility is like is something that I kind of it's a it's it's super important with websites and because there's a there's a lot to communicate and you know it's uh, Google uses it as one of its metrics for deciding how ranked you are as well. So it's not just a preference. It's there are some drawbacks for doing it badly. They'll know if you don't have a strong contrast ratio. Okay, so if you are doing more web and UI kind of uh, colors, then logos, are it's, it's more to do with the text and the way size versus color contrast is a, a big part of that kind of like color accessibility. And it's something that can be tracked and either rewarded and punished as well. Uh, Sarah's frozen. Um, let's have a look at another one. Um, so Sarah question. How can we color grade? So from uh, Sayan Muck, uh, how can we color grade when the TV and monitor shows different color? So if you're going to be coloring, uh, color grading to the internet and everybody's monitor around the world, it's very tricky to do it. What you'll probably need to do is, well, it's tricky, okay? Uh, every monitor is different, so there is no like complete right rule. And if you are grading towards like broadcast television or film, then there are total um, specific uh, monitors you can get, okay? And um, to make sure that you're doing it 
perfectly and properly and going out to that broadcast standard. Okay, there will be a, a you know a color grading standard to match. Um, but when it's going out for the internet, which a lot of things are now, it is tricky. You can get a proper color grading monitor, but if you're going to YouTube, it's probably not worth it, in my opinion. Like I've sat behind some very expensive computers only to look at it, be told off by somebody who's looking at it on some ancient laptop that is not looking good, and you're like, <laughs> so it is tricky. Like, and um, for me, my monitor here, and um, my laptop it exaggerates color. My monitor here, this LG one, doesn't exaggerate the brightness or the colors nearly as much as any Mac that I've used. Mac love to go just a little bit more on the old contrast and color, and uh, um, whereas PC, for whatever reason, whatever technology they use, or it must be something to do with uh, software, comes out with a blue tinge, and Mac comes out with a nice kind of warm glow, and uh, kind of unavoidable. You're back, Sarah. Yeah, you're gone again. All right. Uh, other questions that Dan can answer. <laughs> Not color uh, um, master, but I know around some of the technical stuff. Let's have a look. Oh, we need Sarah for these ones. Let's go. Hey, buddy. Hi. Hey. I've got a question while you're back uh, from Jesse. I wish pink wasn't only in line with female lines. What more com uh, and that more companies should use it? Pink is a tricky one, huh? Okay. Jesse, I think that I am totally with you because pink is around a lot more than it used to be for all sorts of products. But what you tell your client is <laughs> the Victorians ruined a lot of things. Um, so pink used to actually be a color for boys because it was the watered down version of red. And it's interesting that we call pink pink and not a tint of red, which is what it is. Um, mm. Because, you know, the, the, the men used to go into battle. I call them men. I don't know why I think about them. <laughs> not real um, men. They were know, pretend they were men. To, they were bears. <laughs> Real men going <laughs> off to battle. Um, you know, they they had, um, you know, they would, would wear a lot of red for, for battle and it's the colour of bloodshed. So it's actually quite a masculine colour at heart um, and the tint version of it, pink, used to be worn by the Roman um, young boys. So you could tell your client that actually it is quite a masculine colour. <laughs> you know? It's a, it's it funny is, how it appears more like... It's I really would... annoying. I would have not used it as a young 20 year old because it was a girl's color, but it, it's become yeah. like, I would have no problem. It would be tricky maybe for an older, to pitch the design for an older generation, but there are a lot of cool brands doing cool. Like they, I think it gets sucked up by nobody wants to touch it. The middle doesn't want to touch it, but the extreme eventually goes, we're taking it and we're going to use it because you guys are too scared to. And it becomes like, skate brands and drifting and like all that kind of yeah. like grungy edge stuff goes yeah, yeah. we don't care and we're going to use it but it does say something about that like if you yeah. did a logo and it was pink it needs to well it doesn't need to but it's probably communicating a lot um on the edges differently from if it was something kind of i don't know more yeah, traditional totally and, and you've got to think about all the other things that are going with color, you know, the type of font it is and, and that kind of thing as well. But you're right, you know, colors have meaning and they have cultural things attached to them and there's no way you can get away from it. And um, gray, Monica says, I like gray. What's your opinion about gray? Can you, can you <laughs> like go straight in? Like, let's, let's focus on branding here. Like, can you go, like monochromatic is different, but can you go could you go gray? It'd be tricky, wouldn't it? I mean, you can go gray. What's wrong with gray? I don't want you to defend um, gray. I just want to see, like, in practical terms, no, it probably very. Of it, you know? <laughs> no, it's... I mean, there wouldn't be. I mean, you know, silver very different. So you might have a brand that is quite luxury, and you do loads of like printing, packaging, and you use a silver spot metallic or whatever but then when it's on your website it's in gray um 
it depends what it's around. You know, if it's grey on black, then it's going to have this feeling of sophistication. Um, you know, it could be a little bit dreary. Um, what is my opinion on grey? It's a neutral colour, isn't it? But would you have, like, so say you're doing concepts with... for a brand, would there be anything in there? Like, I'm just picturing, I yeah. wouldn't have any, grey. I wouldn't it's, have one option in there as a as a colour, as the, the colour. Grey's in there, yeah. In colour, that's what. So when Dan and I were studying, grey or like a charcoal was very in vogue with an orange, terrible to get a good print of grey background. You would want to be doing a, um, you know, a, a um, Pantone job on that. But um, it was cool with a bit of serpentine typeface. And, Ooh, uh, yeah. Now you're speaking, and speaking to my but, um, early 20 year old. You know, it's a very new color. <laughs> yeah, it's a good neutral color. And often brands will have a gray as a neutral color um, within, within their um, brand um, colors. Uh, so they might have, you know, um, if it was the early 2000s, an orange, a blue for high contrast, uh, and then maybe they would have a grey, um, a light grey. So it's definitely a neutral colour. Greys don't have to be grey though as well. They, not, You wouldn't just put in a desaturated, no. you'd put in, grays. you'd have a warm or a cool grey or something. You'd be yeah. doing something with it, right? Yeah. And... Yeah, exactly. You look at your um, Pantone colour books, if you've got them, and you can see all the different sorts of warmer greys. Um, I think there's like warm grey seven and, you know, and it kind of goes towards slightly, um, yeah, it's got slightly redder tin tinges in it. So they're very valid and, you know, lots of skincare brands are using lots of those kind of warm, soft grey. We lost her again. <laughs> uh, um, there was a question here when before Sarah comes back. Uh, Clifford Salomon, Amazon has color wheels uh, from the color wheel company and they find it super helpful for color selection. So don't always rely on the printed version. It'd be cool to have a color wheel on your desk. I have never had it, but as soon as you said that, I'm going to go order one of those because be great to have that especially if you could turn it and have a few of the different kind of like you know a split comment yeah, split complementary and uh analogous um and a few other ones the other one is handy is having a pantone swatch book because and um, if you don't know you've got kind of two ways of mixing physical color in the real world digital color mix anything uh in the oh she's coming on uh in the in the physical world, you need inks, like your printer, okay? Most printers print with cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. You mix those together and you get your color. The palette's quite limited though. There's no like neon pink or like nuclear red or any of those colors. So what you end up doing is, let's bring her in, is getting a Pantone book. And what they do, Pantone is just the company who mixes up pre, oh, she's got one. <laughs> And so that company there, named Pantone, they've got pots of ink that the printer uses. And you, as the designer, go through, pick pick a favorite color in there, Sarah. A favorite color? I'll pick any How color. How about this is the 2020, the 2020 color is something around this, isn't it? I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's like a, a purpley mauve, e uh -huh. blue color. There you go. So that there, you'll be able very, to go to the very. printer and say, what's the number on it? Uh, 2706C coated. So you, you, you'd be able to go to the printer and say, hey, can you print this business card in this color? And you give them the, I can't remember the number, it was too long, but you give them that code. And the cool thing about it is they'd be able to print it and get it exactly like that little swatch in your book. So there's no like, oh, this is not the same. But you could also give that same code and that same business card to somebody in New Zealand and Ireland and India, and they'd all come back with the exact same color. Whereas if you use process color, which is kind of what your printer at home uses, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, and you gave them all the same color file, you'll get three or four different colors and they won't all look the same. So that's why somebody, so a bigger brand, right? Would like, when would yeah. you be picking Pantone colors, Sarah? Would you always, or? Would... Yeah. So what what's really cool, somebody asked before about whether you picked a Pantone color first or not. Yeah. Um, it's, I work with this, um, which is Color Bridge, and 
you know, if you're starting out, it's a lot of money to buy one of these guys. And, you know, I didn't have one for a long time. But if you are going to buy them, I would recommend the Color Bridge. I do not get paid by Adobe. But from in Pantone. here, you can choose a Pantone color. Oh, sorry, Pantone. Blur. You can choose a color. And then it also gives you the CMYK breakdown, the hex code, and the RGB. Oh, hex so, code as well. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and whenever I'm doing brand guidelines, I would specify all of those things. Um, obviously, it depends what your logo is made up of as well. So if you've got a one color logo, then it's highly likely that that brand would get printed in the Pantone color, you know, if they're putting it on a cup or on a t-shirt or um, what have you. But if it's digital, obviously, it doesn't matter. Um, you can't control what other people's monitors are. Um, so I would recommend starting with the color bridge and you have to load these into your Adobe programs as well. Don't forget to download the Pantone manager and pop them in um, or else these colors won't show up in your programs. Um, so yeah, you've probably all seen brand guidelines and they list out all the, the colors um, of each brand color in CMYK and then you know what what the company uses and puts into their Pantone, uh, sorry, PowerPoint or or Google Slides or whatever it is that they're using. So, it's consistency is a big thing um, for brands. So if you can give them what they need to be consistent and to build their brand consistency, then that's obviously really helpful. Hey, um, Sipa's got a message here. Is there a way to see the color wheel inside of something like Illustrator? Yeah, so um, any color in Illustrator, if you click it and you see those sliders, I mean, that's moving through the color wheel. Um, it's not the kind of color wheel like this. It's the color wheel that goes into darkness and out to shade. So it's um, working through the tints and the shades as well, all those different values. Um, so yes. Um, there is, there is definitely. That's what you're you're working through, um, basically. A, a big if you want to see the big wheel. old wheel, um, it's probably better to go yeah. out to color.adobe.com, right? They've got a. Yeah. The cool thing about yeah. them is they've got, like you said earlier, you can click on the, um, you know, the different split complementary and then the kind of con, uh, yeah. you know, oh, complementary so and contrast and just jumps around and can help your. Yeah. Hey, I'm just and a reminder for the breakdown as well of the colors, which is great. Sorry. Nope. Um, just to remind everybody why we're here, um, A, to uh, talk to Sarah Parkinson Howe, but also it's Sarah's uh, new course that's just been released on uh, Bring Your Own Laptop. Uh, so go check it out. It, the link is in the description. It is, the new course is called Color Theory. Okay, so Sarah takes you through, kind of uh, starts with Color Theory and kind of gets a little bit more practical towards the end. But um, that's why we're here. Uh, next question. Gradients and brands. Uh, oh, does anybody, is there any... If you've got a logo that you want anybody to, Sarah, can you go have a look at the five hour energy um, energy logo? Type that in. Oh, she's frozen. Urgent. Oh, yeah, I'm here. I haven't frozen. Okay. <laughs> you've frozen. Hey, okay. <laughs> no, no. Uh, can you go and check a, go check a logo called the five hour energy? You might not know it. It's, it's super amazing five Red Bull. Five hour energy. energy. Oh, God, yeah. Red Bull. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, it's it. There's no real feedback. Oh. It's just like, oh. what do you think? Um, <laughs> like, what do you think? They're Is they're this proposing a real life thing. Yeah. They're they're proposing. Yeah, it's it's a it's a um, huge energy drink in the US. Um, yeah, I've yeah. Okay. It's a big yeah. Company. So um, the the big sort of glossy lozenge um version of it. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty bad. Um, it's interesting because they've got that one, but then the five hour energy where it's just in black and white, the man. I'm it's amazing how it changes. So anybody person. watching Google okay. five hour energy because yeah. by itself, mm -hmm, but in that lozenge, <laughs> whoa, it's whoa. got a gloss and all. Yeah. Yeah. And it's even got like a beveril and emboss and a frame around it. You know, it's a real badge. I mean, badges can be done very cool. Um, for sure. Uh, in this case, you're allowed no, to say, yeah, cool. you're allowed to say but it's not good. High contrast colors, you know, it's it's very um, reminiscent of that um, that category, I suppose, of energy drinks. They all look pretty pretty bad in that in the way of 
fine. Um, Have a look at yeah, it on the bottle. Sure it's an interesting one. Bottle. Scroll down and see it on some of those bottles, and it's it gets way better. Like it's it's amazing how bad the lozenges and how good it kind yeah. of becomes on the actual. Yeah. Picture. I don't it's know. Definitely. Better. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Like the landscape wrapped yeah. round and stuff. Yeah. You know, we are definitely getting better. It sort of looks like something you might put a fire out with. You know. Um, yeah. Um, somebody like said touch points. <laughs> um, what are touch points? We talk about it a bit. Oh, what are touch yep. points, Sarah? Yep. Touch points are all the places a brand um, goes. So it might go on the side of a car. That's a touch point. Um, it's the places where a consumer is going to cross paths with the brand or see the brand. So it will see it on a social media little profile. It will see it on the side of a car and might see it on a billboard on the side of a building. It may see it on a cup at a sports stadium. Um, you know, so it's it's all the places that the consumer interacts with the brand. Cool. Hey, I got a question. This is an interesting one. I don't know the answer to. You might not. Uh, Julian, is there a oh, no. is there a job called color specialist? Um, can you be an expert in color but not good at other design fields and still enter the industry? I've got a hunch. But do you know any color like that only do color? All right, Sarah's frozen. So I'm going to give my opinion. Is you might have to work in a big agency. I, I doubt there's anybody that has just that role. I'm sure you'd have to be part of being part of the brand strategy. Um, you might not be doing the design work, like picking fonts and designing it, but you'd be in charge of you know doing that color theory and deciding which colors and what they mean to their audience. So probably not a specialist specific job, but probably somebody's job amongst other parts of the design, um, you know, design field. I could be wrong. I come from a very kind of like working at the freelance kind of level, worked at big agencies and I just, yeah, it was always, it would come from maybe brand strategy but they'd be doing a lot more than just color picking. They'd be picking, you know, deciding what kinds of shapes we'd be using, what kind of, you know, would it be, you know, what kind of animals and or marks or, um, you know, how to position it and giving that work, kind of giving me a kind of a brief, creative brief, a mood board as well. Um, that'd be part of that one. So it's back. Hey, buddy. Um, hey i've got another one uh got this one uh logos sorry about the live broadcast going down i'm That's not right. sure why yeah internet's oh. pretty good here but it's going through a few things it's going through ecamm live and then who knows where back out to youtube yeah. so uh, a question was um logos one color does, you know if you're designing a brand does it have to be like one color yep. or two colors three colors is there a rule there's no rules. There are no rules. Yes, there's rules. So, I mean, because I, you know, I was talking before about how different life is now. Like back in the day, we didn't have the internet. We created a logo. You want it to be as strong and as recognizable as possible. And often it's really great. You think about Starbucks. They practically own that color green, don't they? So it's very recognizable. Whenever you see that green, you know, you think of Starbucks, same with Airbnb, it's got that certain pinky kind of peachy color. So one color is very advantageous for a brand to, to really get cut through. Uh, um, but you know, Instagram has a gradient of color, you know, I suppose the kind of brand it is means that it's mostly online and digital. So there's no reason why it needs to be a single color. Um, would you yeah, then argue uh, that a smaller brand might be better off picking a smaller palette of colors to be different. You're like Instagram could be, any, they could, they've changed their, like, they've, they've, you know, they went from billions of customers and changed their logo yeah. to a gradient. It's not a, it's not as hard a jump for somebody like that. Um, even though I'm sure the internet blew yeah, up when they changed definitely. their uh, logo. Um, but yeah. I like the idea of Yeah, it's about being consistent a, really and stick yeah, color. I mean, you know, the Twitter blue is another example. They they purely have that blue. And even though they're...
All right, Sarah's going in. <laughs> Where we at? Okay, let's look at another one. Finding another one that I can do. It's funny because I am a designer and color. Sarah's way better at it than me and communicating it better than me. I, like, through my courses, you'll know I get a bit sloppy with color. I'm like, well, I pick this color. And then I, you know, I when I'm doing branding, it's different. But when I end up doing stuff that doesn't have a really clear brief, I end up not, you know, being a little bit more casual with colors. But when it comes to branding and actually having to communicate that idea with a client, then I have to be a lot more rigid we're well, not rigid but a little bit more deliberate about my um, color choices but a lot of the, especially with my own client through bringing a laptop i can get a little bit lazy with color and it's just it, so i kind of lose a little bit of confidence because i'm not being so deliberate with my colors anymore so that's why i fall back on sarah parkins and how to a deliver this course but also advice on color and advice for you guys and um, so i guess i, I say that because I guess to be a good designer, uh, you don't have to like know the color wheel inside it. Sarah knows color wheel and she's an amazing designer. I'm a good enough designer and uh, have to kind of go back to basics a little bit every time where I'm kind of doing a brand. I have to go to the color wheel. It's not kind of like in there where Sarah is like and just picking great colors. And I'm like, oh, I need to figure this out and like spend a bit of time in my kind of panto manual and <clears throat> seeing what other brands are around and i'm sure she's the same but there's a lot more you can become more intuitive not i don't think it's because sarah is smarter about color she's just you know she's just done it more and she's got a lot more experience and she's had a lot of positive feedback and a lot of negative feedback about colors so has a really good repertoire and um, let's uh look at another one Mm -hmm. Ooh, the Meta logo. Sarah comes back. Want to talk about that one? Oh no, the Meta is somebody else. It's come. She's come back. Hey, buddy. I'm back. Hey, um, uh, Meta asks, um clearly uh facebook um uh zuckerberg wants to know uh i both design logos and websites but i too often spend too much time deciding on color choices do you have like an idea of how to like give some sort of structure or a bit more e efficiency to like picking colors like for somebody who's just wandering yeah. around the internet I guess um, one thing to do is to look at the category, like all your competitors. Um, so what are they doing? Um, and you might want to associate yourself with them. So you might choose similar colors or you might want to disassociate yourself from them and stand out from the crowd by choosing something completely different. So I guess mm. you've got to make a decision about what your brand is. Is it coming in as a kind of disruptor in, in a category? So if it's eco products, for example, you might go green because a consumer's got about 90 seconds to, to decide, you know, what it thinks of a product and it goes, oh, it's green, it must be eco, picks it up. But eco products are out there a lot more now. So you might be looking at a sea of green and you've gone for bright pink, mm. neon pink, like, uh, so you're Method, breaking yeah. the rules of that category. Ah, yeah. So really you've got to, got to have a think about, you know, we, we, you know, and that's why good strategy and brand positioning done before you're creating a logo is really valid. Um, and I know that a lot of us may not get the opportunity to have had that done beforehand. Um, but if you can kind of do a quick competitor, competitor analysis, and what is really helpful is then putting your brand or that logo that you've created on a page with those competitors for your client to see. Um, and that's something that, you know, one day when I do my logo design course, I show you the process that I go through, but that helps your client to see, oh, look, I'm really standing out or yes, I look like one of them. I look like a bank or I look like a, um, massage, um, therapist logo. I, I, I'm taking on the same sort of, um, look and feel. 
That's so really interesting. Like, it's, it, I know, yeah. It, like, it doesn't um, answer I, the question. No, but, but I can. It it can, it brings it down, right? Like, because it's not like you know, it's not giving you a color, but it it excludes like so if if you've you know, I like that idea of if you want to look different, then here's all these colors you can't pick. Or if you are looking to try and look like some look like in a category and try and blend in and be part of that and look like you're one of them, then <clears throat> here's a bunch of colors you can pick from. Yeah, I think it's a really great yeah. tool. Hey, um, yeah. uh, I've that one. Lost that one. Another good thing around that too is thinking about your brand as a personality or a human. So, like, Dan wears a lot of black, but um, it doesn't mean that he's sad or is deaf. You know, it's quite sophisticated <laughs> and and um, and and it, it stands the test of time. It's timeless. And so you could argue that, um, you know, Dan is, he's a timeless person, aren't you, Dan? I'm timeless. You're an elegant I will live forever. <laughs> Sophisticated, mm. uh, especially with your glasses on. Mm -hmm. mm, maybe not. <laughs> but, you know, maybe he's wearing black because he wants to look like he's sophisticated, you know? Um, Steve Jobs always wore a black polo neck and we sort of think about him as 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 being a, a, a you know one of the best designers you know um, but yeah you think of your brand as a personality and then you soon um, you soon can choose choose colors that you think would match match that person um, 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 was in there it was in there it was a good one um, oh <laughs> clients and color so Let's say that, you know, you've got two clients, one very like receptive to everything you say, and the other one <laughs> sitting there with a cross face and you, you get a sense that like, would you, you know, like in terms of choosing colors, do you have to kind of, you know, would you, def would you go into battle for your color just as much with both of them? Or would you read the client and be kind of like, how do you navigate that when you all cross faces there? A bit Yes, it's a bit of a bit of a um, that's when knowing your color theory is really good because you can bring out and say, look, traditionally yellow's been seen as a color of wisdom, of happiness, you know, and you can start to talk about it. Um, and it's a really good way of even firming up why you've made those choices. So I've gone for an analogous color scheme because. I want this to feel calm. I want it to feel um, like a safe brand. Um, you know, it's it's that language around color that is really good to use when talking to your clients because they're like, oh, okay, yeah. Oh, you've gone for complimentary because it's high contrast and it's, you know, think about um, the New York Knicks and LA Lakers. They use purple and yellow, and that's why I've used it for your sports brand because, you know, so 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 they're they're kind of starting to understand because, you know, a lot of clients aren't visually literate um, in the way that we are, and that's why it's very good to go through a process with them. So I've chosen these colors because, and this is where they sit, you know, on the active side of the color wheel. So they're kind of dynamic, passionate, all these, you know. So you're using that terminology that's reinforcing their brand and their values and things like that. Um, and that's, you know, gone are the days where you would go away for five weeks and come back and go, ta-da, this is your logo. <laughs> you know, you're working with your client now and you're you're saying, hey, you know, this is where we're thinking of going. This is the territory we're working within. Does this feel right for you? Yes. So you design within that territory. And, you know, quite often that includes colors. Um, you know, there's always going to be an idiot that says, uh, I like blue. I want my brand to be blue. But, you know, there's a huge spectrum of blue. There's, you know, there's light, bright blues and there's very dark, dark navy. So there's still <laughs> there's still areas of blue you can work in. <laughs> uh, red. Red can be nuclear red. Um, did you ever see that yeah, exactly. dead bike I had? Pink bike. Damn it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go on, yeah. Um, I remember so, burning uh, along. Daya um, asks, um, would you always use a warm color when designing educational material for kids or is it better to have a kind of balance in your design? It's quite specific, but like Again, if you're tackling kids education, yeah. is there a go-to colors? Um, I guess if you think about kids education, you want to, you know, automatically you think of like bright primary colors, right? Which nobody 
probably wants to design with because they're very clashy, <laughs> red, blue, yellow. Um, but you know, tones and tints of those could work well. When you think of education, you kind of think blue as well, blue or yellow, wisdom. Um, so I guess you're going to look into the color, color meaning. Um, this is the thing, there's no hard and fast rules. That's why people find it really difficult, right? But if it's an education, online education, and it's breaking all the, you know, the education kind of rules, it's not in the classroom anymore, you're doing online learning, it's taught by lots of different people, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, it's breaking the norm of children's education, then you're probably not going to go with the kind of normal blues and the red, yellow, greens or whatever mm. that you think. So of brand the positioning children. is more important than it's brand positioning deciding is what category like. you should be in. Yeah, exactly. I like it. Hey, yeah. um, um, uh, that's a good one. Where can I get that color book from? Who do you your color book from, Sarah Parkinson? Pantone.com. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, is anybody else irritated that Pantone is now a subscription service? I haven't. Yeah, really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody's going to subscription. Yeah, they're just, it's like, oh, I know. I'll do what Adobe did and just go to subscription. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, it's tricky. Yeah. Okay. But if you buy your Pantone book, you can you can um, make sure you, when you buy your Pantone book, uh, you're gonna move you go it a little bit in front of your register. face. We can't quite see. Go that Sorry. way. Yeah. Yeah. When you buy your Pantone book, you get a registration number. Yeah. So go online, register it, and um, you can download the Pantone manager and get the books into your Adobe programs. Um, and I don't think you don't have to pay any extra for that. So that and that will give you a month's free trial. Um, so do do that. How much, uh, if you, I can't remember, they were really expensive. Can you remember how much that yeah. box was? I think this one was 500 or 700 New Zealand dollars. So that's about a squillion US dollars. <laughs> uh, it's about a thousand New Zealand uh, US dollars, roughly 1100, something like that. Is my... No, other way around. Oh yeah, no, other way around, cheaper. Oh US. yeah, you're right, I'm going the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah, so it's probably about um, 300 to 500 kind of US dollars. Yeah. Yours you could easily it. spend, you know, a couple of grand buying the various books easily. You need to, if you're new and you don't want to spend that kind of money, just buddy up with a local printer. And uh, that's where I got mine they from. Go they were, I think yeah. maybe you got rid of. Did you get rid of one and I got it, or did a printer that we used I to work with? I got rid of one. Yeah, I think yeah, one I of think the printers printer. was given up a book, well, and that's how I got them. mine. I'm sure yeah, it's uh, Dave. Dave from Press oh. Print. Dave from Press Print. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Any, what we'll do is we'll do a last wrap up of what's in the course because a bunch of people have joined us now later on uh, later on in this video and don't know why we're here. We're talking about color theory. Why are we talking about color theory, Sarah Parkinson? How? Color theory, it's one of those things that designers see as a very gray area and it's hard to choose colors. And I just hope that in the course, I give you some tips and tricks and some, some knowledge to help you choose colors, to understand color, um, the psychology behind it, the color harmonies, which are really important. Um, and if you know those, it helps to really then make decisions about what colors you're choosing for the designs that you're working on. Um, some useful tips and tricks in there about creating mood boards and, and, and creating color palettes out of imagery that you like. Um, what else? Uh, talk to you about Pantone, Hex, RGB, all the different um, color, um, color terminology and things like that out there. So, Because I think that's probably what's most important for like my conversation with you today and what is in that course is that there is no like, oh, I didn't realize you just had to like turn that switch up and that had to be down and you had to tap that three times. You get the, there's no like actual way. It's more like, like when we, it's, a, it's about understanding what you want to do and then understanding yeah. things like the color wheel and kind of combining, like it's a, there's no specific rules, but it's about understanding yeah. what you want to do and then getting the language right. Because yeah, it, it's exactly. so bit tricky, right? Because otherwise, you don't, yeah. you know, you think there should be some sort of uh, exact match thing for it, but it's not. It's a, it's a. I mean, there is. 
<laughs> there is in the colour rules, but you're, you're, you're mixing science and you're mixing art. And art subject subjective. Mm. Science isn't. So you're, you're finding that middle ground. Um, so and it's okay between, to be confused you know, if you're new, because it's confusing, because there is yeah, no specific rule, and it's about it, practicing and doing it. Yeah, and totally. I remember courses. sitting in a field of blue. Can you remember that when um, we, were at, uh, we, we were in our studio? <laughs> and I couldn't get the right blue for um, oh, some precision diamond drilling um, job I was doing. And, um, drill pro? Oh, I just... Yeah, Drill Pro, that was it. I remember <laughs> sitting in the sea of blue, just trying to pick a color blue, and, and it was coming out of my printer, this color, and then the printer, you know, and it was a really big learning curve and, and understanding about what you see on your monitor if you're printing with your local printers. And that's the problem. If you're printing with your local printer, their printer is going to be collaborated in a particular way. So you need to do a proof with them if that's where you're printing your work. Often now we are, we're, you know, designing for an overseas client and you're getting it printed there locally. Get your client to proof it. If they like, like the colors and they're happy with it, then they'll print it there and then get them to send you, um, you know, one of their business cards or whatever. So you've got that on file if you ever do the printing, um, you know, in your country. But it's it's a lot trickier with that but that's why the color bridge is good because it's i heard dan talking before about how it's a pre-mixed ink when you're dealing with pantone but also if they can match it to the cmyk on here then you're you know that's half the battle can you give your mic a jiggle something's crackling a little jiggle, bit jiggle, 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 jiggle. yeah jiggle or stuff uh that is going to be it so uh, check out the um Check out the course on Bring Your Laptop. It is Color Theory with Sarah Parkinson. How it is on byol.com. Launched tonight. Thank you very much, Sarah Parkinson. How for a doing the course yeah, for yeah, us and being here tonight and answering the questions. Thank you so much. Sorry, I dropped out so much. It's okay. It's difficult for me. <laughs> um, All right. Yeah. So good luck, everyone. I hope you enjoy the course. Bye, Sarah. Bye, everyone watching. Okay. See. You hang.